Hi everyone, thanks for joining us here on Smithsonian Science How. We have a really great show today about meteorites and to talk about them with us is geologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Carrie Corrigan. Carrie, thank Hi. you so much for being here. Thanks, yeah, thank you for having me. So Carrie, you're a geologist here who studies meteorites. Yep. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, so geologists are people who study rocks, right? And meteorites are rocks, but more specifically, they're rocks that, that come from outer space and they've passed through the Earth's atmosphere and landed on the Earth. And where from outer space are these meteorites coming from? So more than 95% of them come from the asteroid belt, but we actually do have a few that also come from Mars and the moon. So you brought a collection here for us to take a look at today. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing? Yep, you can see I brought a, a number of different things and they all look a little bit different and it's because they're all different types. But here is the some examples of the kind that we have that we have the most of. 95% of the meteorites that we have are these. And you can see they look a little bit different from each other, but they also look different on the inside than they do on the outside. Yeah, it's pretty dark. And actually looking at all of the different examples that you've brought, they all have this dark surface on them. Yep. Now before you tell us what that dark surface mm -hmm. is, I think we should ask our viewers, what do you say? Yeah, that sounds great. Viewers, here's an opportunity to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us what you think by responding in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. The, me the surface of the meteorite is dark because our collections managers polished it, Earth's atmosphere polished it, it was cut with a sharp tool, or it is coated with a different rock type. Remember that this is the same place that you can post questions for Dr. Carrie Corrigan to answer during our live show. And we have a special guest, fellow meteoriticist from the Natural History Museum, Dr. Tim McCoy, also answering your questions in the chat today. Carrie, we can see the results coming in in real time, and 82% of our viewers think that the Earth's atmosphere polished these meteorites. What do you say? I would say that they're pretty much right. So the, most of the people guessed the right answer. So actually the fusion crust is what this is called on the outside of these meteorites. And it actually forms as the meteorites coming from space and it's traveling really, really quickly. And it passes through the Earth's atmosphere and is going so hot and rubbing up against the atmosphere so fast and so hard that it actually melts the outside. And then it hits the ground and cools off. Very cool. So what's causing these meteorites to actually enter into Earth's atmosphere in the first place with that much speed. So out in the asteroid belt, where most of these are from, they're actually meteor, the asteroids are crashing into each other. And some of these get launched off as meteorites and they're traveling, you know, they have to hit each other pretty hard. And as they're traveling <coughs> through space, they're actually, there's no space as a vacuum. There's nothing for them to rub up against to slow down. So they basically hit the Earth's atmosphere, and, and that's the first thing they've encountered to slow them down. So they're traveling really quickly on their way in. So once they land on Earth and you find them as a scientist, can you look inside these meteorites to find clues about that impact that they had out in outer space? Yeah, there are, there are a number of different ways we can tell about the impacts, and that's actually what we're trying to do. Some of my research revolves around actually trying to understand the collisional history of the whole solar system. And some of these actually have been hitting each other so hard that tiny little diamonds, which take a lot of pressure to form, have actually formed. So this is a uralite, and it's one of a number of couple of different meteorite types that have diamonds. And this is a, the picture of it under a microscope. It's beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. So do all meteorites have diamonds? No, a few types do, but mostly the really primitive ones, and, and but not all of them do, no. And so what, um, do you have an example here of a different meteorite that has some kind of evidence of a collision that isn't a diamond? I do. Um, I brought a, a great example of another type of clue that we use to understand how, how rocks have collided together. And this one here has a melt clast. This white clast in the rock is actually a piece of an asteroid that has been hit so hard that it melted all the way. And it may be a part of the same asteroid that this came from, or it may have been one that came in from somewhere else. So and these is that are what we're seeing now? Yep, these are them underneath a scanning electron microscope. So you're actually looking really, really closely at those melted grains. So are you studying this area of melted um, meteorite to be able to understand um, these bigger questions about the solar system that you just mentioned? We are. So these are these are from the asteroids that I've looked at. This is part of the asteroid belt. But you can actually look at pieces of the moon, for example, and 
the moon has um, a record of impact that's really, really, you know, it's been happening forever. But the, as an, there's a picture of an impact here, and you can see as the impact crater is forming, the red melted part, it actually splashes out, and you end up with these melt clasts all over the surface of either the moon or the asteroid belt, or so, the asteroid that you're looking at. So the Earth, we know, and if you're looking at this through time, we know the solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago, and the moon actually formed from a really large impact into Earth about just after that, actually not too long after. So we want to know what happened after that, even from then until now. So is there any way to tell actually how old that impact, the one that you were showing us, is? There is. We can, we can actually use isotopes to try and date that, um, and we do that with the moon rocks too, and we think at on the moon, there is a big cluster of melted material that is 3.9 billion years old, but not really very much material older than that. So we know there must have been some really big event, we think it's called, uh, that happened at 3.9 billion years, and it was either, people call it either the late heavy bombardment or the lunar cataclysm. But you can see you know, lots of things impacted the moon at that time. And we're also trying to understand if that happened in the asteroid belt. So you said that that's evident in the moon. Yeah. Why wouldn't it be evident on Earth? Because if there was a big event, would Earth be getting bombarded at the same time? It, it would, actually. It should be all, you know, the same. The material that's coming in should be hitting both. And we have, on Earth, however, we have water, we have volcanoes, we have plate tectonics, all these things that are actually erasing the clues to the Earth's past on, that are on the surface. So what kind of clues do you have on the moon? Well, you can look at the moon and look at the surface and see those really big, you know, craters. The big, if you look at the moon, it's, yep, you can see it's got those big dark basins. And each one of those is actually an impact basin from when something hit the, the surface of the moon. And then you, we can look at the rocks at the, for example, the lunar meteorites that come back or the rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought back and understand and try to study the melted pieces in there to try and understand how they formed and when they formed. This is all very cool. And I mean, for, to do all this kind of work, you have to identify where these meteorites are coming from in the first place. Right. And you showed me a little bit about how you do that in your lab here at the Smithsonian. Yep. It was very fascinating. Let's show our viewers. Okay. Carrie, we're somewhere very special and it happens to be the place where you work. Where are we at? Yep, we're in the meteorite vault in the Department of Mineral Sciences at the Natural History Museum. And you can see behind us, this is where we store our meteorites. These are special cabinets that actually keep the humidity level or the water level low in the air that they're in to keep those meteorites from rusting. So how many meteorites are here in the meteorite vault? We have about 5,000 in this room. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you know where all of the meteorites come from? Yep, so that's one of our jobs is to figure out where these meteorites came from out in outer space. We can look at this one, for example. You can see it's got fusion crust on the outside, and that's what forms when it comes through the Earth's atmosphere. It's really heavy. That's a clue as to how we know where this came from. It's full of all that shiny iron nickel metal, which is really heavy. And so we know that this came from an asteroid. And this one we've sliced open. You can see that we just took one of our cutting saws and, and sliced it right open like a loaf of bread and just look at the inside. And that inside is where we can see most of our information. We have another one over here. So this looks very different if you have a look at the, this has been sliced open also. The fusion crust on this one is a completely different color. You want to hold that one. And it's pretty bumpy and it looks yep. like there's a lot of different rocks or something inside of it. Yep, so that one is actually from the moon. Wow, really? Yep, and you can see right away that the two of these are very different looking at them. And that's because the moon's surface has been hit by so many asteroids and meteorites through time that it's just been getting churned up and churned up. So each rock, you know, the new rocks that they make are made up of lots of little pieces of other rocks. So how can you tell for sure that this is a moon rock? We would make another slice of it, this time a much thinner slice, and we would glue that down to a glass slide, and then we will polish that to the width of a human hair. And then we can look at it in the microscope so we can pass enough light through it to be able to identify what the minerals are inside. Different types have different minerals in them. Can we look at that now? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Okay, so I've put the thin slice of the rock here on the stage of this petrographic microscope, which is a kind of microscope we use actually to look at rocks and try and understand the minerals in them. Have a look. <gasps> wow, I didn't think it would be that colorful. Yeah, it's beautiful. So we've used a special kind of light called polarized light, and that actually brings out the colors in the minerals, and that can teach us about their composition and what minerals they are, and that actually helps us figure out what kind of rock it is. So if you have a look again, 
we can actually learn even more when we turn the stage. <gasps> wow. It's like the colors are changing or flashing. Yeah, it's like a kaleidoscope almost. So we can actually learn more about the minerals when we do that than just when we hold it still. So it's really not just a pretty picture, you're getting important information yeah, out of Yeah, exactly. This. Carrie, that was super cool. I actually got to hold a piece of the moon. Yeah. It was amazing. And then I got to see how colorful it was underneath that microscope. So do all meteorites look like that underneath the scope? Yeah, and you can actually hear it on, see it on the screen here. Yep, so this is, a, this is a piece of the moon, the lunar meteorite that Maggie held. And you can see it up close that it's actually made up of lots of different pieces of other types of rocks. Very cool. Yeah. And it was surprising to see all those colors underneath that microscope. Right. So that is how you actually identify a lot of these different minerals and um, meteorites and their origins. Right. Yep. Do you have any other examples to share with us today? Of, um, of things underneath the microscope? Yep, we do. So we have a picture of a chondrite. So these, the meteorites I showed you first, those are, are ordinary chondrites. And if you look, this is one underneath the microscope. And you can see all those round circular things and there are the chondrules that make up a chondrite. And those are the, basically in the same way that they were four and a half billion years ago when they formed. Wow. But then we have another one where this meteorite has probably been melted. So you can see that instead of having all those individual little minerals, these minerals have all kind of sm are all kind of smashed together and they've regrown in that space. I wouldn't mind looking at meteorites under microscopes and yeah, identifying them. It's a lot of fun, and you can tell them <laughs> apart pretty quickly. It's really beautiful. Carrie, let's learn a little bit more about your work. Okay. You work specifically on the Antarctic Meteorite Collection, right. and you have actually been to Antarctica to collect mm -hmm. meteorites. I have. Now, I was wondering before I talked to you why you would ever go to Antarctica, and some of our viewers might be wondering the same thing. Yep. So let's ask them what they might think you, why you would go there in the first place. Sure. Viewers, here's an opportunity to participate in another live poll. Tell us Antarctica is a good place to search for meteorites because it's cold, mountainous, windy, or close to outer space. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window that appears to the right of the video. The results are still coming in and there's kind of a smattering across all responses, but yeah. most people think that it's because it's cold. And, and they would be right, but actually it turns out that it's because it's cold and because it's mountain and, mountainous and because it's windy. And while it has the highest elevation of any of the continents overall, that probably doesn't help because meteorites actually fall all over the earth equally. But the cold is what has the really the main reason. So if you can see on the graphic on the screen, the meteorites fall onto the ice and then they get buried and then they travel with the ice and they get, they get stuck up against the, the mountain range called the Trans-Antarctic Mountains that run the whole length of Antarctica. And then there's such a dry, strong wind that they actually be bringing, you know, sort of degrading the ice on the surface and the meteorites get left just sitting there on the surface waiting for us to come pick them up. And just like this, yeah. is that you with a meteorite? It is me with a meteorite and that was probably the biggest meteorite we found the season that, that season that I went. So do you pick your field sites based on where those mountain ranges are? Yes, we do. So if we, we know that Antarctica is basically a dome shape and the ice flows downhill, so we know where it's going to get stuck when it hits up against those mountains. And we can go look for places that are called blue ice regions, and those are where the ice tends to be really stuck. So you can see on this map the place the La Paz and the McAlpine Hills. Those are two of the places that I visited, and those are right along that mountain range. And this is another place I visited called Meteorite Hills, and actually, each of these red and blue dots is a meteorite that was found in one of two seasons of people that went to search for meteorites there. So that's a well over a thousand meteorites. Over a thousand meteorites? Yeah, just so in you, that one place. And you can visit this same location year after year and continually find new specimens? Right, yeah, usually we'll go back um, maybe a few years in between because the snow blows around and things get uncovered that we may have missed before. That's very interesting. Yeah. So. What is it like to actually go to Antarctica to look for meteorites? I know that you sleep in tents in sleeping bags on the ice. Yeah, we do. And it's, it's a really long trip and it is cold, just like everybody would suspect. Um, but it's really exciting because some places you go, you're the first person to have ever been there. And you're the first person to find, maybe the first person to see a piece of space. And it's beautiful. It, and it's beautiful. So this is a place that we camp. You can see the image there. That's our practice tent camping, and you can, we practice learning how to use all that equipment. And it's right next to the southernmost active volcano on Earth called Mount Erebus, which is cool. And then they take you out into the field, and um, 
you use the snowmobiles to search on just this bare ice like this, or you may walk around in glacial moraines where there are a lot of terrestrial rocks that you're actually trying to find the meteorites that are sitting in between all of those rocks. What a fascinating trip yeah. that must be. It is, yeah, and it's a little bit lonely, but it's, it's an amazing experience. Amara has a really great question that comes in by video okay. about, um, that really plays well to this conversation about Antarctica. Okay, perfect. Let's have a look. Yeah. Hi, I'm Amara, and I was wondering if keeping a meteorite in the cold helps preserve it. It absolutely does. So if you, if you think about exposing a rock, any old rock, to water, or if you put your bike outside, right, what happens to your bike if you put it out and leave it out there in the rain? It rusts. And so keeping, Antarctic, and keeping rocks in Antarctica, so basically where that water is frozen, it can't interact with the rocks there where it could here, for example. So keeping them cold and keeping them from rusting is, is one of the great reasons to keep them there. So meteorites can get rusty? They can, actually. They're made out of, out of um, iron. They have a lot of iron metal in there. And if you look at the one that's showing on the screen right now, you can see there's, there are some rusty places here. And this one has a lot of rust in it. Um, it just in these little pockets where it's starting to form. But this one that just came back, the larger one behind, just came back from Antarctica maybe two years ago, and it's got a nice clean surface without much rust on it at all. Carrie, there's a video segment that shows how you keep these meteorites safe from rusting yeah. um, here at the Smithsonian. Let's show our viewers. Okay. <laughs> I'm Carrie Corrigan. And I'm Linda Welsenbach. And we are in the gowning area that precedes the clean room. Carrie and I are sitting in the Antarctic Meteorite Storage Facility in Suitland, Maryland. This facility houses all the Antarctic meteorites that are collected in the US Antarctic Meteorite Program. We have about 15,000 Antarctic meteorites. This facility is a clean room, which is why we're dressed so strangely, and it is meant to essentially eliminate contaminants that may interact with the meteorite. This is one of our dry nitrogen storage cabinets, and you can see they have these funny gloves that stick out, and they stick out because there is pressurized nitrogen gas inside of here. And this is what we use to store our meteorites. And the reason that they're in dry nitrogen is so that they don't get exposed to moisture, and also they're in these cabinets so they aren't contaminated by anything. Keeping things like this and the meteorites that we have in this kind of storage actually preserves them so for that when the instrumentation gets better and better 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now, we can make even more detailed measurements than we can now, but that the meteorites will still be fresh as they were when they came off the ice. In the last 30 years, we've collected more new types of meteorites, including finding meteorites from the Moon and Mars, than we have in the last 500 years. Carrie, okay, it's really interesting that you keep those meteorites fresh. And I understand that you keep them fresh all the way from their trip to Antarctica all the way here to the Smithsonian. How do you do that? We keep them, so we basically, once we pick up a meteorite, we never touch it with our hands. If we can help it, we put it in a bag and we wrap it in the bag and then we put it into um, cold storage so that it stays frozen, basically just stays outside in a box in Antarctica because it's not going to melt. And then it goes on a freezer ship and a freezer truck until it gets to the lab where it's then thawed out. So we're doing that to keep the you know different organic materials and um, keep it from rusting. So keep all of that stuff from getting exposed to the atmosphere and warming up. What kind of things in the meteorites are you actually trying to preserve um, to, for future study? So oh, that's a really good question. So and some of the stuff we may not even know yet, but a lot of it, like recently, people have this, this, they've found amino acids in meteorites, and so we're keeping our organics off our organics off of the rocks for one thing. But we're also looking at for example, we have, I brought a rock here from Mars. This is a Martian meteorite called Allen Hills 84001. And it's a four billion year old piece of igneous rock. Four billion? Rock. Yep, four billion, only four. <laughs> wow, it's really old. <laughs> yeah, it's a really old rock from Mars. But it contains in it carbonate minerals. And carbonate minerals require water to form. So this is our hand sample evidence that there is actually has been liquid water on Mars. So um, older, this so this would have, formed before, you know, all of the collision history on the moon, for example. And that could, it would, the, the carbonates we think are actually younger than that, but the rock itself is four billion years old. 
So you know this rock is special because it comes in its very own case. Yes. Uh, but you said that it's igneous yep. and that it contains evidence of liquid water. Right. And sitting here on Earth, we have igneous rocks. We have liquid water. Right. Um, I mean, does that mean that early Mars could have been a lot like Earth? Yeah, so these are some of the clues. So this is our rock clue, right? The one that we can actually hold in our hand. But we also have spacecraft that are up there taking pictures of the surface of Mars. And we're using clues like the gullies you can see here and um, other layering in places that look like water created those features. So we can use all of that evidence together and, and looking just at the, the surface of Mars, you can see the lowlands. There may have been areas that were filled with water. It, it was probably a much warmer, much wetter place in the past. So how do you know definitively for sure that this rock came from Mars in the first place? Right, so that's another really good question. So we've, for a long time we had these rocks and until we actually sent spacecraft to these plant, to Mars, to other planets, we didn't know that any of the meteorites that we had came from anywhere else for sure. So the Viking landers went to Mars in the 1970s and they measured the composition of the atmosphere. And then later in the 80s, we found we have another type of igneous rock from Mars, but this one's only about maybe a half a billion years old, so 150 million to 500 million years old. But there are melt pockets, so we're talking about melted rocks again, and there are pockets in there that are melted that actually trap, when they melt and then cool really quickly, they trap the atmosphere that is around them. So some scientists were able to measure the composition of that trapped atmosphere and compare it to the measurements that the Viking landers made of the atmosphere, and it's a one-to-one -one match. And you can see the melt rocks, the melt pockets in this rock when from the picture that's showing. That's really fascinating. And I mean, this rock is relatively young in comparison to that other one that you showed us, Allen Hills. Yep, it's yeah, it's much younger. So, and actually, so that tells us there were actually volcanoes that were active on Mars that recently. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So do you have any other um, meteorites from Mars to be able to help you kind of piece together the story? You do, I brought one more. So this one actually fits sort of in the history in between. This is called Nakla, and it's one of a group of meteorites called Naklites, because this was the first one of its type. And these are only a billion years old. So older than the Shurgatites, this other one that we used to figure out that they were from Mars, but much, much younger than Allen Hills 8401 at four billion years. And you can see the knocklights are beautiful underneath the microscope, which is part of the reason I like to study them. They but really are. Yeah, this is another, <laughs> these are more thin section microscope images that are showing. But it's, so this one is a billion years old, but we know it's igneous also, except that instead of being a lava flow, it would have formed from probably deeper below the surface, which is another, you know, so we, we can look at other types of igneous rocks on the surface of Mars. So all of these different meteorites, especially the Mars ones, are helping yep. you really piece together the history of Mars, um, but even the solar system origins. Right, because every one of these had to have come off of Mars during an impact, right? So this, we know this formed deep, but it had to have somehow gotten off of Mars. So either that was a really big impact that knocked it, or it was exposed to lots of different impacts. Yeah, as you can see in this picture, there's a picture of this deeper rock maybe. It could have been at the bottom of that packet of rocks. Very cool. Yeah. Carrie, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your work on meteorites here yeah, at the you're Smithsonian. You're very welcome. We have a lot of student questions, so let's try Great. to get to as many as we can. Okay, sure. All right, the first one comes from Draco. What do the minerals tell us about the meteorites? So, the minerals within the meteorites, um, a lot of times we can, we can look at individual minerals and figure out the temperatures, for example, or the pressures that these were formed at. Um, we can you know, individual minerals form at specific temperatures, so it can tell us some of the conditions that they formed, plus it can tell us the composition of what was around. So we can today, these are made up of iron, magnesium, and silicon, or these are made up of calcium and aluminum, sodium, and silicon, for example. This one is from Mrs. West's class. What is the biggest meteorite on file? So that's a very good question. So the largest meteorite in, that we have on Earth is called Hoba. And it's so big that it's still sitting in the hole it made when it was formed, when it fell <laughs> in Namibia, which is in southern Africa. Uh, we have an audio question this time coming okay. in by video, so let's sure. have a look. Okay. Hi, my name is Crystal, and I just wanted to know if you found anything recently in the slices of the meteorites that you are studying. That's a great question, Crystal. And and since most most of my research talks of, is about impact, then. The answer is yes, we have. So we have been slicing meteorites open, and you can see here's one of them, and we that's just slicing it up like a loaf of bread with a saw. And they're actually, if you look at the next image, 
we have circled some of the things that we think might be impact melts that we're looking for in one of these slabs. And then we would take those and make the microscope sections of them. So this is sort of the next place we would start. So you make new discoveries all the time. We do. Yeah, it's fun. This one comes from Magnus. Okay. Did all of the meteorites form within the solar system? As far as we know, all of the meteorites that we have formed in our solar system. There may be pieces, like I was saying, we have some pre-solar grains in some of the meteorites that may have formed outside of our solar system, but for the most part, we think that they have all come from inside our solar system. KLO Middle School asks, what is the biggest diamond found in a meteorite? All right, okay, well, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> they're not very big, so it's not something that you would break open the meteorite and say, you know, let's make a ring out of this, for example. They're tiny, tiny little things, like microns or you know, maybe, maybe up to a millimeter across. Not, not big. <laughs> Alexandra asks, are there minerals and meteorites that are not found on Earth? There, so that's, there are a few, yes. So we've found, um, and not that many, not as many as you'd expect, because all of the elements are, sa are the same, and the condition, but the conditions are different. So the conditions in space are a little bit different enough that there are some, some minerals that do form in the, on the asteroids that we don't have. And a lot of times, once you bring those minerals onto the Earth's surface and expose them to Earth-like conditions, the minerals will, will actually transform into a different mineral that's stable on our conditions. KLO Middle wants to know how long you've been doing this type of work. That's another really good question. So I've worked here at the museum for about eight years. Before that, I was actually a postdoc here, so a total of about 10 years. But I started studying meteorites when I was an undergraduate purely by accident, actually. So, Did you ever think that you were going to be a geologist, let alone studying meteorites? Probably not when I was in middle school, for example. I barely even knew what a meteorite was at that point. <laughs> and I certainly didn't know you could have a job where you studied them or worked in a museum taking care of them. So, or went to Antarctica or to collect them. Never, no, and to be fair, that's part of what drew me into studying meteorites is actually <laughs> wanting to. And then I had ended up with an internship at Johnson Space Center where I was an intern and I studied I studied the meteorites and got and met a lot of people including my PhD advisor and my boss at that time. So now do you take interns? I do. I've had probably 8 or 9 interns since I started working here. And it's a really fun way that I learn new things while also teaching other people things. Very cool. Yeah. Carrie, thank you so much for helping us understand a little bit more about meteorites and your work here at the Smithsonian. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Can you tell our viewers where they can learn a little bit more if, sure. they're, involved, or if they're interested in getting involved in this kind of thing? Yep, so you can start by, we have the Division of Meteorites and the Mineral Sciences Department here at the museum. We have a website. NASA has some fantastic information about meteorites on their website. And you can get involved by just going to your local geology club. Many of those have kids clubs and you can get involved in that way. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And thank you viewers for tuning in today and asking such great questions. This is it for our show today, but if you want to see this program again, you can check it out at curious at curious.si.edu where there are also some cool links and teaching resources. That's it for this season of Science How, but we'll be back next school year. Have a great summer.